Hello, for today's video lecture we're going to be talking about power screws. So a power screw, also sometimes called a lead screw, uh, is a screw that is used to create a very large force with a relatively small torque. So an example of this in action is this cider press over here. Uh, so here we have a threaded rod uh, and up at the top we've got a, a set of handles and so a relatively small uh, moment up at the top is going to exert a huge force uh, down here at the bottom, uh, allowing us to press the juice uh, out of apples in this case. So these systems can be thought of as wedges that are kind of compactly wrapped around a shaft uh, where a relatively small input force is amplified using the geometry of the setup. So rather than finding the pushing force, which we used in wedges, uh, we're going to need to find the force uh, or sorry, the moment uh, or torque that is needed to exert a large force or lift a large weight uh, depending on the setup. All right, so if we imagine unwrapping a threaded rod, so here we've got a setup. Uh, I've got my threaded rod here in the middle. Uh, it's going to have some torque uh, rotating it, uh, and I've got some platform that I'm lifting in this case. Uh, so if I imagine unwrapping this, uh, I've got the nut is going to be kind of a wedge uh, sitting on a ramp. So this ramp here is an unwrapped version of the thread which is going around the screw. So in this case I have some pushing force which it may be I'm rotating this on purpose, it may be it's just being held in place uh, by some external piece. Uh, I'm going to have some load force so this could be pressing up, kind of lifting, uh, or this could be pressing down uh, like our, we had in our cider press, depends on the situation. We're going to have some normal force uh, between the nut and the thread uh, and some friction force that's opposing motion. So one key aspect of, in all of this is to find the lead angle. Uh, and so the angle is easily specified in something like a wedge. Uh, but for a threaded rod, we don't get that measure. So we get the uh, lead angle, uh, which is going to be important for analysis, based on the threads per inch or the pitch of our threaded rod. So if we've got our thread here, uh, we've got the nut. We want to find the lead angle, which is the lead, the angle of that ramp. Uh, one way to do that is, so in the US customary system, we're usually given threads per inch. So in one inch uh, of vertical travel, I would go around so many circumferences. So one circumference is pi times the shaft diameter. So that's the circumference of one revolution of the shaft. Uh, and say I've got three threads per inch, I would make three trips around the threaded rod uh, for every one inch I go up. So for this, I would have an inverse tangent, one over this length down here to find my uh, lead angle, theta. For the metric system, we often have a different setup. So to find the lead angle, uh, we are given the pitch. And the pitch is the distance from one thread to the next. So in one circumference, so it's just pi times shaft diameter, one circumference down here at the base, I would go up uh, a pitch of maybe 0.3 millimeters. So one circumference, and then my height of the triangle in this case is 0.3 millimeters. Same thing, inverse tangent of pitch over uh, this length uh, here at the base, pi times shaft diameter uh, in that case. So depending on the setup, depending on the, the number you're given, either threads per inch or pitch, uh, either way, you need to find the lead angle as a starting point in the analysis of these systems. And now we've got our free body diagram of the, we're going to do a free body diagram of the nut. Uh, so if we write out the equilibrium equations for this nut and we relate the frictional force to the, and the normal force, uh, we'll wind up with the following equations. So uh, sum of force in the x, we've got f push minus fn sine theta minus mu k fn cosine theta. So I'm using, uh, I'm assuming motion, so mu k times fn is the friction force, uh, assuming I am already moving. In the y direction, we'd have the negative load force, fn cosine theta minus mu k fn sine theta. So this is the y component of the friction force. All right, so this is our equilibrium equations. We're assuming we're rotating at a constant rate. So we want to relate two of these loads, or two of these forces. So the pushing force, the load force, uh, and then everything else is kind of intermediate steps. All right, so we can reduce this to a single equation 
uh, by solving for the normal force in both cases and then just setting the two sides equal to one another. So if we solve for normal force in both x and y, put those together and kind of simplify, I wind up with the following equation. So F push is gonna be sine theta plus mu k cosine theta over cosine theta minus mu k sine theta times the load force. All right, so that is a good starting point. Uh, the load force is whatever I am exerting, so the force of the press on the apples or the uh, force to lift something up in the air. Uh, pushing force is not as straightforward in this situation, so I don't really push on the nut. I exert a moment on the shaft or exert a moment on the nut uh, for this system. So we still need to relate that pushing force on the nut to the actual input, which is a torque. All right, so here is a top-down view, a simplified top-down view. I've got the nut around the outside, the shaft in the middle. Uh, once we find the pushing force, uh, we need to relate that. So it's kind of the on the edge of this nut uh, to the moment where it's sliding underneath. So a moment is simply a force times a distance. Uh, and in this case, the distance would be the center of the shaft to kind of the inside surface of the nut, uh, which is the radius. All right, so if I use that, go forward, put this together. This is what I wind up with uh, relating the torque, the input torque on a system uh, to the load force and the radius of the shaft. So torque is now equal to sine theta plus mu k cosine theta. Uh, again, theta is our lead angle. Uh, and then mu k is just the coefficient of friction between the nut and the uh, lead screw. Uh, F load is the output of this whole situation. So the force in the apple press or the lifting force, uh, kind of whatever we're trying to do with the lead screw. And then our shaft is the radius of our lead screw. All right, so this is a, an important equation for all of this. This is usually relate what we need to do to relate. We either have a set load force that we need to know the torque to make that work, uh, or we have a tor torque and a lead angle and we wanna figure out how much force can we exert with this system. All right, so building on this, we can also talk about self-locking screws. So this is what hap is happening going up, but what if we release our system? So for our apple press, we are twisting it and then we let it go. Uh, other systems, we kind of turn off the motor and let things go. So the pushing force uh, is going to actually disappear. So if we get rid of the pushing force, uh, it's gonna wanna slide back downhill but friction now is going to reverse directions because it's going to oppose that new sliding motion sliding downhill. So friction changes direction. So if the friction is large enough, if we release this, it just kind of stays where it is. If the friction is not large enough, uh, it, the whole system kind of undoes itself. Um, and if it stays in place, this is called a self-locking screw. Uh, if it kind of undoes itself when you release the input force, uh, it is not a self-locking screw. So why do we care about this? So the friction force, if the friction force is not sufficient to prevent kind of sliding, uh, the nut will turn on its own, lowering the load quickly. So in our cider press, not a big deal, let go of it, it undo itself a little bit uh, and then kind of stop. But if we have something like this car jack here, which also has a lead screw in the middle, uh, if we wind the car up and then let it go, we want the car to stay up. We don't want to wind it up and then let go and then the car lowers itself right back down. So many cases we want to ensure that we have a self-locking screw uh, and we'll need to do some further analysis to see if our system is self-locking or not. So generally the uh, nut is less likely to slip if we have a gentle slope, so smaller lead angles. So the self-locking angle uh, is the cutoff between uh, a self-locking screw and a non-self-locking screw. So where so small angles are self-locking, large angles are not. Um, the dividing point again is this angle, uh, which we're gonna call theta locking. Uh, and below that it is self-locking, above that is not self-locking. All right, so to find the self-locking angle, we're gonna do the following. So we're gonna assume a pen impending motion uh, that means that the friction force is mu static times Fn. We're gonna draw the free body diagram with an unknown angle. Uh, so theta 
locking is the unknown I'm solving for. And then we're going to write out the equilibrium equations for that system and solve for the unknown angle, theta. All right, so this is our sum of forces in the x direction. So we've got a portion of the normal force and a uh, portion of the friction force. So this is the normal force, this is the friction force. In the y, I've got the load force, the normal force, and the friction force all in the y direction. Uh, and using the x equation above, we can solve for theta in terms of the coefficient of friction. So for this, we're solving for theta uh, in terms of sine and uh, cosine and fn. Um, so the self-locking angle is simply the inverse tangent of the static coefficient of friction. So one of the things I can do to make a screw self-locking is to make sure it's got a really gentle angle. But I can see from this, I can also increase the coefficient of friction. So the larger the coefficient of friction, the more likely it is that our screw is self-locking at a given angle. All right, so that's all we have for today's video lecture. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you again.